Uh, you think so? so sometimes I'm not sure though. Uh, um, uh, it's it, it, it's I'm still it's sort of for the industry, but not that. So I thought we have license to sell. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I thought you were very very weird. Let's see. Let's see. I hope so. Where I want to see you. Thank you all very much for coming. Yeah. Um, thank you to the Jordan Center for hosting us. Um, thank you to the Jordan Center for hosting us and making this happen. I'm Anne Lounsbury from the Russian Slavic Studies Department. Um, I'm going to start out by introducing this morning's speaker and this morning's discussants. And then I'm going to ask, since we're a small group and really the goal is to discuss, I'm going to have us go around and just we'll all introduce ourselves briefly. And then Michael Holquist will speak. So this is Michael Holquist, Professor Emeritus of Comparative Literature at Yale University, who is going to present his work. And we have two discussions, Ilya Pligan of NYU and um, Nasser Zakaria <laughs> from as of this morning, of Drew University, and why don't we go around and, and introduce ourselves? So Peter Stander, uh, University of Pennsylvania. How are you doing? Brian Bernstein, Drew University. Konstantin Moraki, I'm a slightly important interviewer. Christopher Phillips, I'm in Gallatin, in Rhino Gallatin. Nicole Sarah McGregor, too, and Eric for that I'm Michael Shapiro, uh, former Brown University, now of Columbia, off and on. Uh, Michael Gordon, I teach history of science at Princeton. Diane Greenstock, studies library over here. Thank you very much. We, we missed someone. You're missing someone. Oh, but I'm on for one hour. I'm so sorry. So my name is Xenia Tatashi, and unfortunately, I have to get a call out there. So I have to be there. Well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to talk uh, an insanely long paper through. I'm not going to read it. Um, but I'd like to begin by thanking Dan and the Jordan Center for uh, bringing us together uh, to discuss so improbable a topic as we're addressing today. Thank you. Um, Russia is, is well known both as the uh, home of great mathematicians uh, and of uh, great uh, authors, great poets and, and novels. Um, the, the unlikely project of uh, at least some of uh, what we're I hope we're going to be talking about will be to think about um, possible relations uh, between uh, not, not so much uh, historically instanced Russian mathematicians and Russian uh, authors, but uh, uh, more generally about the problem of how uh, mathematics relates to everything else in our lives. Uh, so that um, it's, it's a problem uh, that goes back very far. I, I, I'm interested in this topic. I think it's important that we discuss it because uh, this is a, a, a black period in the history of philology. Uh, humanism is on the defensive everywhere. And while uh, some of my friends, I was just at a thing trying to defend the humanities at the new school, <laughs> and, uh, and everybody is talking about the aesthetics and the responsibility and the ethics of reading. All those things are important. But the, the, the problem is, is not to convince, I think, people that uh, learning how to read difficult literary texts uh, helps us be better people. I'm not sure they've done it. But, but, uh, uh, 
uh, but rather to recognize I mean, that uh, we, like everyone else, are confronting uh, uh, a tsunami of quantification. Uh, it, it, everything is now being turned into statistics. Uh, uh, information theory is the dominant force, it seems to me, that stands over against what we uh, the, the, some of us that are old guys, I mean, traditional humanists, uh, uh, want to think that we, we, we stand for. So the, the general uh, sense of our meeting, I hope, will be something like humanists and historians uh, and, and literary critics um, trying to point, uh, figure out what the relation between mathematics and electrical abstraction and the, uh, how that relates to the, the Singularity of individual experience. Um, so, uh, the problem that we confront is, is an old one. Uh, the mystery of the order in mathematics is, is something that has uh, plagued uh, both in Asia and in the, uh, the, the West. Um, thinkers from uh, as, as long as, for as long as we have uh, writing. Uh, so, but, but it, it's, I think, significant that the timeless abstraction of numbers and the existential immediacy of human events has intrigued no, nobody more than mathematicians themselves. And as it happens, uh, we meet in the shadow of the current institute for advanced mathematics. I mean, uh, it's a block away over on Mercer Street. And it was there on May 11th, 1959, that the theoretical physicist Eugene Wigner, I mean, the Nobel Prize, uh, gave the first of what has since become the very famous current lectures in mathematical theory. Uh, the title of that inaugural lecture, he was the first to uh, give the current lectures. Uh, it might well serve as a subtitle for our meeting, our meeting today, I mean, and it was the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Uh, Wigner was uh, bemused by the fact that uh, mathematics is so useful but so inhuman, uh, and uh, posed the question precisely in that opposition that perhaps he speculated. Uh, the very uh, strength of mathematics consisted in its uh, divorce from our humanity, from, from the, the, the things that, that make us the fallible beings that, that we are. Um, he, uh, in, in, in this lovely essay, I mean, he writes very well, uh, uh, he uh, makes the point that he, he doesn't have words to talk about mathematics. Uh, and so he turns to metaphor uh, in trying to uh, make clear what his problem is. He says that uh, the physicist portrays the law of nature as a series of doors to which mathematicians uh, uh, are, are given uh, a bunch of keys and who, having to open several doors in succession, always hit on the right key on the first or second try. Uh, and he adds, with an uncanny suggestion of the parabolic doors, if you remember the uh, section on before the law in the trial, uh, he adds, and I'm quoting Victor again, he became a, a spectacle concerning the uniqueness of the coordination between keys and doors. The physicist who is using physics. The awe that he felt before the human power of numbers as a modern uh, instance of it is, is a modern instance of an ancient tradition of thinking about his enemies before some remarks that, that uh, talk about uh, Platonism and, and, and Kabbalah. Uh, to get to the point where um, I try to relate this problem, this general problem, to uh, a subject that could responsibly be uh, sponsored by a Slavic department. 
<laughs> so uh, it, it, I, I, I then turn to uh, some of the great cliches in uh, the study of classical Russian literature. I mean, the 19th century uh, uh, canon uh, is encrusted with a series of uh, cliches having to do uh, with uh, superfluity, superfluous, uh, uh, habit, uh, the table of ranks is something that everybody brings up, uh, the illogical nature of logic, uh, the role of chance and card games and duels plays a very large role, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to argue in, in a huge uh, generalization that these are all elements in a larger attempt to understand the abstract dilemma of how notional patterns relate to lived events. Uh, and I then go through a couple uh, examples taken from Pushkin. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, from Lermontov, uh, the, the uh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about this in detail, I mean, in, in discussion, but uh, uh, along the way, I try to suggest, I mean, voting is a particularly interesting uh, uh, case, and I'm, I'm going to pause for just a moment to uh, talk about um, the diary of the man uh, for uh, a number of reasons. One, technically, I mean, the uh, this is an important uh, text in the history of, of formalizing genres in 19th century Russian literature because it, it's the uh, first really concentrated uh, expression of how significant for thinking about uh, the problem of pattern versus event uh, diaries. So that is People just say, well, no, I mean, 19th century Russian literature is riddled with diaries. And uh, 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 what I, I try to suggest is that the reason uh, the, uh, the book example is so important, it is, first of all, the only text that he ever uh, published in the first person, the only fiction he published. Uh, and I think that's significant. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the demonstration of the contrast between the linear progression of the dates on the one hand, bump, 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 one, two, three, uh, versus the extraordinary disorder that fills in the page under the date. Uh, I mean, it, uh, of course, Bogle, like as he always does, takes us to an extreme, uh, as you remember. I, I, and uh, we have the his diarist uh, ending of uh, writing fantastic numbers. He doesn't uh, manage to keep the linearity even of the dates. And the, the, the point at which he uh, does not, I mean, when we, we go from the calendar as, as we share, to the calendar that is peculiar to the hallucinations of uh, Gordon's diarist, uh, is, is the point in which he discovers he's the king of Spain. And uh, what, what I, I try to suggest is that uh, the importance of this is that the, the uh, events to which he refers, the historical events to which he refers, uh, the uh, wars of the Spanish succession that begin at this point, uh, the fall of Algiers, uh, and the uh, uh, revolution in, in French, the flag revolution in, in Paris, that uh, of all of these uh, events that affect it in his delusion about being Ferdinand VIII, it, uh, uh, bring into question the uh, illegitimacy of the identity of uh, dynasties. That, 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 that the linearity that constitutes dynasty is is challenged in the revolutions and 
and overthrows. Uh, in three cases, I mean, the the, the uh, uh, Ottomans uh, uh, have ruled in Algeria for 400 years. I mean, uh, uh, Charles X uh, uh, wants to put more of them back. This is a French history. Uh, and and the, the the Spanish King Ferdinand the Seventh was uh, uh, another group. So uh, there is. And what I'm trying to establish is that the uh, question of how numbers relate to people is posed in the Diary of a Madman as um, a question about authenticity, legitimacy, and the uh, degree to which it's important to be extra numeral. Uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, degree to which uh, sheer uh, linearity cannot guarantee an authentic identity. Uh, uh, this comes out in a lot of ways in the, uh, the, the checks, which I'm not going to go into in order to go on, to uh, make a, a, a passing reference to the Confessions of St. Augustine, which I think are important in helping to understand uh, Patricians turn to madness, that uh, it, it's a kind of anti- uh, conversion experience that he has. Uh, uh, but it's a, an anti-conversion experience that is structured formally very much as Augustine uh, organizes his confessions as a, a series of chronological events when he's young, when he's still not a Christian. Zap, he hears Toilet uh, Legate, uh, and after that, in, in the, 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 the last four books, you, you get this meditation on time and salvation. It's, it's an extra calendar. And I, I, I think that that is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, a paradigm for a lot of uh, later fiction, not just Russian, but, but certainly in, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in Russian classical fiction of the 19th century. And I, I also heard along the way to the work of Ernst Kantorovich on the King's Two Bodies, which uh, uh, is uh, a, a history of the medieval concept that uh, the king was sacred and had, uh, although he looked like he was just somebody, uh, was in fact, sorry about that, uh, 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 he was um, in fact uh, two people. I mean, he, he was like Christ, who was a human being, but also a God. The king was uh, this man who was born a certain year and will die in a certain year, but he was also the king. And in so far as he was, he had a sacred identity. So, I mean, the logic of the king's dead one with the king is that the, the sacred body of the king is continuous. And it's, it, it's the, the importance of that for Borga, uh, it seems to me, is that uh, he's demonstrating the degree to which the the sacral body, which has been de-sacralized into sheer mathematical progression in the dynasties that he uh, uh, refers to, uh, it no longer works. It's, it, it's uh, uh, it ain't visible any, anymore. But the, the, the great uh, example in, in Russian literature, it seems to me, I know you have, you've already thought this yourself, probably, but it, uh, of uh, opposition to sheer mathematics is Dostoevsky's uh, 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 And I won't say very much about uh, why it might be that Dostoevsky uh, does that, but I think it's important to. Dostoevsky uh, besides being uh, an extraordinary um, uh, inhabitant of language, it, 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 he's he's really. Uh, um, I mean. He's really good at language. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, 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 what that leads him to, I think, uh, besides, uh, it leads him to a lot of really great 
uh, neologisms, but it, it also leads him to uh, uh, the conviction that a, 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 a paradox uh, at the center of human existence. I, I mean, so the the, the, the uh, if, if this talk had a, 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 a whatever a, 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 a motto, it would be from Dostoevsky, when he says, that is, uh, uh, humans are really stupid, <laughs> phenomenally stupid. And what he's expressing, I think, uh, by that is the, the, the truth that we are, are ineluctably compelled to confront the paradox that the way we organize the world is, is always fallible, whether it's through language or through numbers. That uh, 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 the accuracy, of the way, one of the ways in which he dramatizes it, that certainly most of the is that the accuracy of numbers depends on their ability to generalize. I mean, they never get to the thing itself. I mean, it, 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 like my, uh, uh, so that his characterization of Petersburg as the most abstract, famous characterization, the most abstract city in the world, makes it the place uh, best to think about an abstraction. And the degree to which it uh, manifests the truth that the man is not the territory. That there is always a gap between the system of generalization and the specific thing that system is important to uh, define. Um, I, in connection with that, of course, I, uh, he poses his famous contrast between two times two equals four. Times two equals five. Uh, this is, is I, 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 as far as I know, the one is yet done. But you could write a, a multi-volume book uh, on, on a treatise on the subject of two times two equals five. To get this opposition, two times two equals four, two times two equals five. I'm going back to the Greeks. But, uh, uh, but in, in modern times, it, it, and I, 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 I mentioned probably only those instances, uh, except for George Orwell, uh, uh, those instances from the 19th century that Dostoevsky would have known, and in fact, uh, uh, indirectly the first. So the, the first of these is the uh, use by the ABCS I mean, uh, uh, in the period leading up to the revolution, when he's criticizing the uh, French organization of society into three parts: the nobility, the military, and everybody else. And I mean, it's the opposite of the table of ranks, right? I, I, the the, the uh, important point is that, of course, everybody else constitutes the enormous majority of the population, and yet in the Assemblée Générale, they are given the smallest number of votes. So it's, uh, in, in order to uh, uh, dramatize the absurdity, the political absurdity of the situation, he, he wrote a, 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 a pamphlet, all two times two equals five. Uh, uh, it is also used by Victor Hugo, I mean, when, when, I mean, who, who was a great opponent of Napoleon III, uh, 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 who took over uh, 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 the government by an election. I mean, the, 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 he's a Napoleon who was elected by the French people. And of course, I mean, he was elected as president, and everybody was aware that he had imperial Christians, and indeed, two years later, after the election, he declared himself emperor. Uh, uh, but the point is, the point is that Hugo, I mean, who was in exile and opposed to all of this, uh, 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 criticized the absurdity of the a, a huge electorate. I, I mean, the pop out, it was a, a, a popular landslide for the point. Uh, uh, wrote a book called the in the book, uh, 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 making fun of the fact that, uh, uh, that this uh, the numerical relation between the vote, the size of the vote on the one hand, and the ridiculous result uh, in, in an emperor was two times two equals five. Uh, so that uh, I, I, there are indirect references to both of these instances, say, uh, uh, Dostoevsky, and in the newspapers, it is that in this time, there are direct references. No, I have a question. Uh, 
At any rate, uh, so 2 times 2 equals 4, opposed to 2 times 2 equals 5, or something that um, was uh, a commonplace in the 19th century. And uh, uh, I, I would like to argue that Dostoevsky's use, however, is singular, I mean, or, or distinctive uh, within that tradition. I mean, for instead of uh, posing uh, 2 times 2 equals 5 against 2 times 2 equals 4 in order to celebrate the orderliness, the logic, the, the sense that inheres in 2 times 2 equals 4, Dostoevsky is talking about, I, 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 he has a, a, a marvelous phrase, which I, I'm not going to quote, but, but, I, 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 but, but, I, but Dostoevsky combines 2 times 2 equals 4 with 2 times 2 equals 5, I mean, in a way that makes them a, a, a yoke pair. It's necessary to him both. Dostoevsky, I mean, they, 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 they speak different truths. And so what's required is some kind of, of dialogue between the, the, the two. By the way, I, 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 I and uh, uh, a title of this uh, uh, Russia by the numbers, and, and that, that induced some of us to think about what that might be in Russia. And we hadn't held the time we were coming up with, with something that would be an adequate translation. Uh, 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 but I think that the it uh, 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 offers this only possibility. Uh, that the, the underground man's phrase uh, by the book, that that inner part to reach me, is, is, is close to why the numbers it, it is, as we have. And that uh, it, 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 it's, it fails simply because it, it doesn't have the, the direct relation to mathematics that why the numbers are. But it is conveying the same or orderly uh, progression. Uh, at any rate, I mean, I, I, I'm going to get out of uh, uh, looking at particular Russian texts now. Uh, you go to ask the question: uh, Why, why worry about this ground? Uh, 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 why uh, would would any uh, responsible person spend time studying the central role that Catherine versus the event plays in 19th century Russian literature. Uh, I, I think, I, at, at this time, uh, at the present time, I, I, I think whatever, right, I mean, as we do, needs to be justified in the present. And, and in, in the present, it seems to me, the, the virtue of the Russian uh, example is that uh, we are living in an age of, I think this is not news to anybody, but I, I, mean, I don't, along with others, recognize that we're living in an age of uh, intense quantification. Uh, quantification to uh, a point where uh, it's, it's changed some of the basic categories for organizing historical experiments. We, we get a, a, to the point where we really don't have uh, a good tools, it seems to me, for understanding the enormity of what is, is happening in our education systems and our military systems, I, 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 the dominating technology. I mean, it's, uh, 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 statistics have become the new uh, crystal palace, really. I mean, industrial sense of, of, of the word. Um, so why, why, why should we uh, 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 do that? Because I, I, I think that Dostoevsky's opposition to this, especially Dostoevsky's so 2 times 2 equals 4 versus 2 times 2 equals 5, is a conundrum that has taken a new force in an increasingly digitized world. Um, but the question that might ask, be asked, why should literary point to that? Because there are the problems that seem to be rooted in fields far distant from their expertise such as mathematics, and the more outre limits of electrical engineering. And there's somebody who uh, uh, failed algebra and then had to take it again in order to pass, and then failed geometry. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real question. It's a burning issue. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the answer, it seems to me, is simple. 
I mean, as the unworthy heirs of uh, a philological uh, literary, uh, we more than most believe it is our language that makes us human. As humanists, we thus bear a special responsibility to language in all its aspects. And what I uh, am going to go on to argue then is that it is uh, uh, a new sense of what language is that is the, uh, I, I say it's the key to a lot of other things, but, uh, but it's certainly the problem that should most oppress uh, uh, the heirs of the great philologists of, of, of the past. And the opposition between mathematics and uh, real life uh, it is, uh, can be grasped better, it seems to me, uh, or at least talked about you know, in an easier way, as an opposition between mathematics and like numbers and words, the system that each constitutes. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm going to uh, pass over a number of uh, uh, historical illustrations uh, 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 in order to make the argument that the present moment, uh, insofar as it can be tied to a beginning at all, uh, begins uh, uh, with the work of uh, engineers, physicists, and mathematicians during the period immediately leading up to, during, and immediately following the Second World War. That it is uh, the, 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 uh, the evil genius in all of this is, in, in, in my view, uh, Constructive is uh, is Claude Shannon, uh, who is a, 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 a man I, 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 I not well known for reasons I, I I'm not he's increasingly coming to be recognized for what he was, but I mean it's it's important just to bring us all up to to uh, uh, date. I mean he's the guy who uh, really invented the information theory. I mean, he, he was an electrical engineer and physicist who worked at Bell Labs during the war. And what uh, uh, was one of the important uh, uh, forces in breaking the German Enigma Code. Uh, but in doing so, he had to think about the relation between numbers and language. Uh, the way in which he uh, succeeded in breaking the, uh, and, the enigma, and the way in, in which, by the way, uh, uh, the uh, Japanese purple cone was, was broken as well, uh, was by uh, using a technique that is in ancient in the history of cryptography. And that is to conceive uh, repetition as a key to meaning. So that, I, I mean, one of the more famous examples of this is Ed Brown Poe's uh, 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 story about the, uh, the gold bond, uh, uh, in, in, in which there's a, a cipher that has to be uh, interpreted. And, and, and uh, uh, Poe points out that uh, he breaks the code because uh, the, uh, the uh, to a system that understands that Q is uh, something that occurs very rarely in English. And by uh, identifying the instances where Q appeared and the few words that use Q, he was able to break it. But well, it turns out that all languages are, uh, in some sense, numerically based. That there, you, you can chart the repetition of uh, uh, words uh, in a way that will let you uh, read the code not as a language, but as a set of statistics of the frequency of uh, occurrence. So that um, uh, what he did was to um, get 
uh, uh, a numerical breakdown of uh, usage of words and, and phrases in German. And on that basis, they were able to reduce uh, the, the, the uh, enigma uh, code to, um, uh, as I said, a series of, 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 of numbers. Uh, on the basis of his work, uh, Shannon uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, with uh, uh, another very interesting man. I'm going to say I, just very quickly something about because he's at the heart of uh, Warren Weaver uh, of, of uh, machine translation. Uh, uh, but the the uh, just to make sure we we are, are all together. I want to quote uh, what I take to be phrase that opens the, uh, the digital age. It's when uh, in uh, during the war, uh, Shannon wrote a book called The Mathematical Theory of Cryptography that was classified. It couldn't be uh, read outside uh, military circles. But after the war with Weaver, he published uh, something uh, that, that Use the same principles called the mathematical theory of communication. So it went from mathematics to communication, uh, uh, from cryptography to, uh, and in, in that uh, uh, book, uh, which I recommend to everybody who wants to understand how we got where we are today, uh, he says, frequently, I'm, I'm quoting Sharon now, the messages have meaning. He puts it into to uh, uh, italics in the end of it. They refer to or are correlated to some system with certain physical or conceptual entities. Now, first of all, think about the way he's talking about, uh, about reality, right? He's talking about right, right, the, the reference to the word. And then he says, again, in, in uh, 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 italics, these semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. And in a 1950 paper, he actually says, the meaning, and he puts it in quotation marks, of a message is generally irrelevant. That's not how to read it. And anyway, uh, uh, the uh, success of, of sheer quantification in studying uh, a language led to uh, a boom in machine translation that uh, lasted until 1960, the 1960s and incorporated, uh, 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 it, it permitted the uh, CIA to hire people like Noam Chomsky and uh, uh, Michael's former uh, uh, teacher, Roman Asipovic Jacobson, some of the greatest languages uh, of, of the 20th century. To work on this problem of machine translation failed. This I, I was actually paid by the Air Force. Well, there the Air Force. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was in the early 50s and early 60s. Right, right, right. Uh, so so the, 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 it looked as if this was not going to work. I mean, there, there was a famous report in 1963 that was sponsored by the government because they spent zillions on this failed uh, attempt to use numbers as a way to read language, natural language. Uh, uh, and it, it, it didn't, they were still doing things like, I remember Ron uh, was talking about uh, the, the program he was working on, which would translate Leonardo, yes, didn't you? So there's a sense in which, uh, uh, these cryptanalysis I, I, and uh, uh, the, the mathematics of, of, of some other more sinister physicists who were working uh, at Princeton classes at the time, uh, uh, actually in Princeton, uh, 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 at any rate, uh, I, I, it, it turns out that uh, both the man who broke the Japanese code and the man who uh, uh, broke the, the, the German code with Turing. I mean, we were close to him. We have to talk about that as well. 
uh, uh, they both spent turn later in their lives to uh, literature. And uh, the, the man who wrote the chapter, who, who's the man who invented the term cryptanalysis, uh, who's a Russian man, who's born in Russia, a Russian Jew, uh, 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 became the great expert on Shakespeare uh, and claims, uh, uh, defeated all claims that uh, it was not Shakespeare who wrote the Shakespeare plays, uh, uh, published. Uh, uh, very good point. And, and uh, it was the case that uh, some of the others became very interested in Lewis Carroll. I think the relation between critical analysis and nonsense is pretty close. So I'm going to close. I, I, I've gone way over time. We okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, so I, in, in closing, I, I would say you know, something like this. Um, it, there is a use of two times two equals five that is uh, not uh, invoked by Dostoevsky, and that is, of, of course, I mean, but, but Dostoevsky is there because he's, I, I think, a media source for Orwell's use of two times two equals five in 1984. Uh, you'll remember in 1984 that. Uh, there is a philologist uh, with uh, the, the unlikely name of Slime, which suggests both uh, muck and uh, uh, ethical lack. Uh, at any rate, it is he who is seeking to invent new speak. The only language, as he says, which every year has fewer words. And it has fewer words because the end of the philology of this is to get to a point where language is perfect. And he, he, he pronounces what, 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 what is the, the motto for, uh, if, if you don't take Shannon, you can take uh, uh, the philologist of the Ministry of Truth, is the revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. That is, when, when the language is as good as math, it will be the revolution. Will be the, the question, what is the revolution? Well, the revolution uh, 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 it might well be uh, uh, the turn to a new uh, anti-humanism. Uh, there are people, I don't know, where I, I know there's some people at, at the table who have read Ray Kurzweil, but I, the, the idea that uh, in the uh, singularity he's talking about, humans and machines will somehow become super, some new kind of hybrid that will look back on our current disorder as uh, uh, kind of an uh, animal stage of, of development. And uh, it, it's, it's not, I mean, for Slavists, I mean, Kurzweil is, it is uh, an interesting figure because it turns out that his greatest dream is to use retroengineering to bring his father back to life. I mean, he like children live. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's extraordinary. I, 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 uh, 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 but the point will be that the, the father he, he brings back to life will not be his father. It, it will be some kind of, of uh, <laughs> a, 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 a image of his father. <laughs> at, at any rate, it, it is for this reason, it seems to me, that in, in an age when, when modifications take uh, uh, advance to the point where uh, people like Bruce File are appointed by Google to uh, and, and given billions for research uh, to uh, work on educational uh, possibilities of quantification. Uh, it, 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 it's at that moment when it seems to me uh, the lesson of two times two equals four must be put together with two times two equals five. 
becomes uh, really uh, crucial and makes the work of people who do uh, the kind of work that's on the street uh, gives it its dignity in the present moment. Thanks. Thank so, so <clears throat> we decided to split the two of the dimensions of the paper. Uh, the, 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 the scientific, historic, historical, historical, scientific, and so on. Yeah. We'll go to NASA, obviously. And I will try to to sort of open up some of the literary points again. Um, so NASA will be Okay, so um, uh, should we also confess about I guess we should. <laughs> 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 well, it's just, uh, just in order to explain that there may be, if, if there are moments of, of um, insularity, they, that they come from regular lunches, three of us have to talk about So please feel free to break through that. I don't want to go out of business tomorrow. <laughs> That was a disappointing confession. <laughs> 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 I mean, so actually, from in that perspective, I actually found it really quite challenging to to come up with questions, partly because, as Michael and Anna know, I find this Michael's reservations about the first of the computation um, very compelling. But I thought, therefore, as a result, it might be a moment to to air my reservations about those reservations. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just going to basically just have five groups of questions, and I'll just basically announce them and make them something that hopefully you all want to talk about more than I do, um, because they're it's challenging for me to think in these terms. I mean, the questions that are being asked about the nature of computation to our present moment, uh, in a way, sort of forces me to speak outside the frame of my, of what feels like um, discipline. Um, but in, to try to do that, so first, is there a way to characterize when the use of computational methods amounts to a kind of overstepping? There seem, for example, to be ethically minded inquiries in which we invite statistical analysis in order to demonstrate discrimination and other forms of harm. So discrepancies linked to race, gender, age, onto, for example, what we suspect to be elevated rates of certain medical interventions. When, therefore, by contrast, is computation unwell, even in these cases, must we understand it as a kind of servant to social commentary and political activism? Is the question of the applicability of computation when it is welcome, unwelcome, enlightening, or obfuscating, germane, or distracting, itself inherently extra computational? So must we constantly actually to try to decide when we should be applying computation, realize that we are forced into an interpretive framework when we sort of assert ourselves? But that question can be embraced by a computational idiom, curiously enough. Um, as one among the undecidable propositions, the truth of which we can prove cannot be proven by a computer algorithm. So like the turing quantum problems. Um, does that suggest something about the way in which computation recognizes its own limits? In its own? And so that's one. There are five. So Relatedly, to what extent does statistics itself turn on its own dichotomy of pattern and event? And if so, does its own notion of events align with individuality? So partly what I'm trying to, to try to wonder about is how stable is the map and does it matter? Is this question of so matter that translates the, the dichotomy of mathematics and individuality to pattern and event? So for example, a claim might be made as to, this is just a Example. Yeah. Need blind admissions at a school, suggesting a particular pattern of acceptance and rejection that is reported to be independent of the income level of the candidate. An event might be constituted, an event in this context, yeah. might be constituted by the rejection of a handful of academically gifted, low income individuals 
whose treatment demands a redescription of the pattern, and therefore perhaps a revision of it. Is there a space here for continually unearthing the individual from provisional patterns as a result of such newfound events, inciting political or legal action? Or is it more troubling that the individual as event is constituted as little more than a contextually interesting statistic in this context? In fact, is there a kind of are we admitting two kinds of failure? Language has a particular kind of failure in trying to capture the individual, um, and statistics has another kind of failure. Conversely, when might it threaten individuality to fail to count as a statistic? What happens when, for example, the individual is judged as an outlier or as something freakish and therefore irrelevant to patterns imagined as structure in his or her role? How often does the failure simply to count individuals, as with medical trials, Meeting certain demographics or as irregularities of voting groups amount to failure to count as human beings. I'm really uncomfortable with these questions, so I'll just yeah. um, So, third question. As Michael suggests, a, a, a good amount of sociology and socio philosophy of scientific knowledge, and much beyond the pedigree of which I have not really known, has taken up the underground man's torturous inquiry into the truth and implications of Tatsuki was born. The undergraduate, the undergraduate, the undergraduate man. <laughs> 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 the undergraduate man. <laughs> really, really well. troubling <laughs> um, Could be imagined to be storming across and tearing up the field of that debate, a debate settled more by time than by consensus. The central question there might be construed as follows. What explains the apparent universality and immediacy of the truth of basic arithmetic, particularly when admitting the cultural and historical specificity of so much truth otherwise, generally? Yeah. But if, as with one of the main sides of that inquiry, mathematics emerges as an eminently human construct, you know, in which mathematical rules are no more or less than human institutions, even two times two times four, then shouldn't a proper understanding of the nature of mathematics itself diffuse the threat computation poses to human self-understanding. Put another way, is the primary psychosocial threat of the age of computation not the pervasiveness of computational methods as such, but an overly ideological or one-sided view of mathematical truth? If, as the different possible positions and debates of the mathematical truth suggest, the meaning of mathematics varies with the individual thinker, and this is something that makes Many people I know puke. <laughs> Don't confuse me with technical language. <laughs> <laughs> then can computational pattern, pattern be individually reflected? Can we remind ourselves through statistical discourse itself that being a statistic might mean different things to different individuals? Statistic. This actually leads into the fourth question, the, the case of transhumanism. Yeah. Um, and that itself might underscore, arguably, the dangers of strangely too much individualism. So Julian Huxley, who um, in, the, in the written version of this Michael, Michael brought up, um, advocated a vision of transhumanism where humanity, now capable of mastering the evolutionary process, takes control of its modern biosocial future. For Huxley, an evolutionary peak was a harmonious and fulfilled human personality the aesthetic and ethical measure of whom was partly the service that individual performed for the collective good. That's how we find out that they are, in fact, such a people, that they are such an enormous By contrast, one of the early poles of the newer transhumanism was a kind of entrepreneurial individualism, again, I almost spoke to this directly in writing, that saw, that saw and sees in exp exponential computational growth the possibility of highly individual gratification, and it's very explicit in this, extension of life, extension and intensification of sexual appetite, cosmetic changes to the individual body, all provided that one has the financial means for these alterations. The great singularity projected by some transhumanists like Kurzweil is therefore in some respects preceded by many small singularities. Understanding by that term singularity, a focus on individual transformation which attempts to transcend the conventional patterns that surround it. And here, um, in the text, Michael talked about the number of ways in which different forms of singularity or different meanings of it are intertwined. So might the dream of totalizing computations therefore promote highly self-involved individuality as much as it does immersive self-admiration? 
Okay, and then the fifth and the last question is Julian Huxley is also a reminder of the question of educational reform. Does the troublesome place of computation in the academy, and he and himself, and his, his as it were, his ancestor, does the troublesome place of computation in the academy suggest another version of the knowledge cultures? One hearkening back more to the Thomas Henry Huxley and Matthew Arnold debate than to C.P. Stanley and Alameda. Recent historical scholarship, some at NYU, in fact, reminds us of the important specificities of these different 19th and 20th century debates and suggests that we take care with any overly superficial com comparisons with the present. But should these comparisons therefore be avoided, if that older Huxley, if that older debate, in that older debate, Huxley and Arnold shared the view that the criticism of life is the essence of culture, as they termed it, they famously disagreed on the disciplines to be privileged in posing that criticism. That debate, initiated famously by Huxley in 1880 at the opening of the Science College in Birmingham, was linked concretely to the formation of new modes of schooling. So can the inquiry into the status of computation be rendered as, does computation offer a criticism of life? And if this is fair, does that formulation suggest that education has already been won over to the merits of computation? As the shifting balance of the natural and human sciences might have suggested in the 19th century, and as Michael explicitly asks us to consider now. So how much and how long have the humanities been digital, however we can speak meaning? So, so should we should talk, should you, you guys know best whether it's you want to address what, your concerns yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I I would just like to say one thing. Yes. I, 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 or did, did you? Or you go, what, what well, did you, it, it takes it in another direction. So if you'd like to read these well, I, I, then, uh, then maybe we should. Or, maybe we should respond to well, this question yeah. first and put it on pause. Yeah. Uh, well, the, 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 there is it, much uh, to respond to. Uh, is, is it so uh, rich uh, meditation. Uh, I uh, think. Though that hovering over all of the five uh, really important questions that, that you raise, uh, there is the uh, uh, aspect uh, that the, the, the particular way in which the five questions uh, uh, got posed uh, leads up. Uh, and, and that is the uh, uh, what, what I understand to be the importance of Dostoevsky in the history of thinking about computation. And he recognizes, uh, first of all, that all uh, systems that generalize are uh, valid and, and, and never are the case. I mean, a language as well as numbers. Therefore, uh, uh, it, it's important that, uh, that mathematical data always be incorporated into uh, a, a non-mathematical context. I mean, the, 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 a, a dialogue, as it were, that is intersystemic between, uh, you know, Existence and 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 and, and math, uh, so that uh, th that's the general answer. I I, I would give to to uh, uh, what you're saying, but, but uh, we we might then, and I, and I don't want to take up time now or, or do that. But let us. I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this. Uh, take into account the specific ways in which the education system in this country is being impacted by. I mean the. the uh, uh, announcement uh, 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 three days ago about the SAT changes and, 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 and how th this really is uh, a, a burning issue that is not being addressed uh, in most discussions of the, of the problem. Uh, so I was very happy. Maybe Michael wants to respond to that. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Other questions? Mm -hmm. um, so, this is an extremely interesting exchange. Uh, I'm, I'm a historian too, so I'm a bit 
my flathead wolf. <laughs> <laughs> um, what if I never was children? So there seems to be two kinds of mathematics which you disaggregate, and I think you should be theoretical, analytical, abstract mathematics, and other statistics. Yes. And uh, the worry for the present moment seems to be statistics. And the worry I would suggest for Dostoevsky is curious also statistics, less than the abstract math. And in, it's, there's a 19th century moment where this thing gets replicated again. So uh, Buckle's History of Civilization in England is translated into Russian, strongly controversial. I don't know if this is not stealing away from where you're going. Yeah, he mentions it. Like it, 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 it's important that Mikhailovsky, this critique of Spencer, mentions it as well. Like if there's this very um, people are upset about Malthus, people are upset about Ketele, people are upset. There is this early team of yeah. chance moment. Durkheim's worried about it, free will, etc. Yeah. Then it seems to go away, and then there's a computation-driven second rise of this, driven by exponentiality. It seems to be the yeah. idea that every exponentiality of Malthus, the first one, but exponentiality of Moore's law. Uh, population explosions after the second one. But there were resources in the first one to critique it that it seems like aren't being invoked now to critique this one. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you see Dostoevsky, Volvo, etc., as providing resources from that moment in time that can be picked up, moved over, and used again. Well, I, 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 I can buy. Uh, very boringly continuing to uh, reference the dialectical nature of the opposition of two times two times in, in, in Dostoevsky. Uh, uh, but that's how I, I, I would look for uh, uh, other examples to, of uh, conceiving the opposition in dialectic uh, terms. And uh, the uh, the first instance that comes to mind historically is uh, Leibniz, who, in one of the letters he exchanges with uh, one of those Bernoulli, <laughs> I mean, there's seven great attitudes in Bernoulli. And I think he's one. Yeah, 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 and, and the kind of um, uh, power that they have for predication. And uh, uh, like it says, yeah, you, you, you can do extraordinary things with uh, uh, statistics as far as making predictions, but you can never get to the end. You, 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 the, the end is always open, uh, and I, I, I think that uh, not in his own way, not in, in Leibniz's own way, but I, I think in, in, in the warning I saw in what Bernoulli was doing, uh, there was an awareness that the the inability of um, uh, statistics to make prediction was limited. I mean, that it always had to be put into it. It, it, it was, it, it, if you will, the, the uh, discovery of risk rather than chance at that point. And, and, and that, that, that's, I think, what, what is the difference between Dostoevsky's sense of the openness of, of, of systems on the one hand and, and uh, the Edmonton's, which, 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 which is, is chaotic. I mean, he's, he's really going back. So, um, I, that's one of the things, but I, I would like also to take up what the, the very important distinction, again, another version of this, I, I try to make that distinction mm -hmm. between the, the uh, theoretical mathematics uh, to which you, you can legitimately apply the term aesthetics. I mean, where there, there, are, there is beauty because there is inutility. I mean, it, 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 it is. Uh, it, 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 well, they're it, it, coming into the technical sense. I mean, that, that is true. Uh, th th that has very little to do with the kind of dumbed down uh, uh, use that's being made uh, uh, of, of statistics, precisely, uh, in, in 
uh, well, among others, in, in, in education. So I, I absolutely agree. I mean, in the point about math, you have to make a difference between applied mathematics, uh, especially in statistics, and, uh, and, and beautiful theory. I, 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 the, although it's a very narrow thing, I mean, John von Neumann, who uh, 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 is, uh, I, I know, both a devil and a hero, I mean, uh, uh, in, in, in any discussion, it is somebody who was uh, more gifted than most at uh, appreciating and uh, advancing the beauty of advanced mathematics. I mean, he astounded other mathematicians. He also is the guy who worked very hard to apply uh, uh, what he had learned to, uh, uh, at least in, in one area of his conversation, to uh, building the hydrogen bomb. I, I mean, the, the worst kind of, of, of application. Well, the, the math of math is, but I, I would want to disaggregate there's the, there's the pure and applied, which is extremely fraught distinction. Yeah, you get, yes, uh, yes. And the sort of analytic mathematics versus probabilistic mathematics, yeah. which both can be applied and both can be pure. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Leibniz invocation is really good. So there's actually three moments of statistics, I think. We have, there is no probability before about 16 bits. Like, yeah, there's no, okay. so, so there's this first crisis of classical probability, there's the second one of statistics, and there's this third one of now. And there seem to be very interesting resistances in each that are distinct. Yes. And I'm, I'm just curious how, this is not for a direct answer now, but how one would find resources in each that apply or don't apply to the literature. That's a very, in the, yeah. uh, in, in the writers uh -huh. of the time, because what Leibniz's problem is, is not the same as what uh, say, uh, Victor Hugo's problem mm -hmm. is with uh, statistics in his period, mm -hmm. and it's not the same as, say, Pynchon's problem is mm -hmm. with statistics in a later period. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, but they are strongly related. There is a, yeah. there is a, you know, a link. Um, One would have to know a hell of a lot more about the detailed history of statistics. Oh, and which I put, I, 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 it is, it is, there are people who know it who are not me. Yeah. <laughs> so, especially in the classical period, the 18th century has a large body of actually extremely robust stuff about this, and which people around here yeah, know a lot more than I It's messy, I'm not going to do There's much more study on the 18th and the 19th century than on the 20th century yeah. uh, because there's less history of increasing stuff, period, because we're bad at that. Um, yeah. But, but it's a great idea. It's a great idea. I mean, to look at the differences. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, a small uh, remark. I think that you know your attack against mathematics would be rooted much better in first century rational implications, mm -hmm. like Zamiati. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are this, you know, a massive critique of in the perfect, perfect, yeah, 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 perfection, yeah, yeah. you know, stability. He's using the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Stasis as something which we avoided. He poses the question of the final number. Right. He's kind of a yeah. plain yeah. as imaginary and, and, and irrational numbers. I think this would be kind of a, you know more apropos. I, 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 whether it would be more apropos or not, I, I, I'm not sure. But it, it certainly would be apropos. And, and I, I would argue uh, historically connect. Of course, I, I, of I, 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 I mean. Uh, 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 I, I, I I think that the Soviet Union is unthinkable without Dostoevsky. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, he he's uh, uh, equally um, how can I say uh, he he, he grasps the problem perhaps uh, I, uh, more simply than the Dostoevsky does. I mean, yeah. and in, 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 but in more detail. He was a mechanical engineer. Yes, we can. So was Dostoevsky. Well, maybe. He was an artillerist. That was what he learned. But it was mathematics. You know, all well reviewed. So, you know, if you talk about the source. No, I mean, I'm sure there must be several 
dissertations, books on the uh, Russian source of so much uh, anti-utopianism in the 20th century. I mean, it, it, it's it's December, yeah. I mean, We haven't even done it by the time. <laughs> Michael. I'd like to offer you uh, a couple of examples and see what you think from uh, Russian cultural history, because I think if we want to bring it back to Russia, then we should look at Russian cultural history. And one thing, just offering as an example, the utter failure of uh, Russian philosophy. But the best that they could ever come up with is intuitivism, which you know has been discredited. Um, there is no history worth talking about in Russia. Whatever, it's mostly uh, second history. history. Philosophy, uh, philosophizing in Russia. Yeah. And this brings up, I think, the relevance to Dostoevsky that he, this is a, a kind of paradigm case of creative misunderstanding that, that what Dostoevsky misunderstood was turned into something which artistically was exemplary. Uh, and I think that's where the tension comes up between uh, artistic creativity and scientific creativity. That um, uh, why statistics? I wrote a paper about 20 years ago uh, about Shakespeare's sonnets, which I subjected to a statistical analysis. And this was the first time it had ever been done. And Guess what the reaction was from Shakespeare's scholars? Mm -hmm. Well, you're taking down a genius. <laughs> and that's the nub of the problem. The statistics always uh, tries to establish a pattern which is applicable to whatever data you, you subjected. You're, and so human beings get bringing back to Stasky. The underground man goes off on you know, he's philosophizing in his own way. And so why is the would statistics even be relevant? Because individuality of creativity would fly in the face of a statistical analysis. Uh, how could a great creative genius like Shakespeare be the subject of a statistical analysis? And so, just, so there is this inherent tension which can never be overcome because human beings misunderstand whether they're creative or not. The, the, social, the Tension between the social and the individual. The individual always, and this, the communication thing is relevant. You know why? Because we cannot speak gibberish to each other without being misunderstood. We have to use something which has been handed down to us. Now, what do we? What does a great creative genius like Shakespeare do? He doesn't create words that don't exist. Well, he creates his <laughs> words. What's that? He That's creates a new words. Okay, uh, but for the they, most part. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in... in uh, you know, it's not Zawin. Zawin was a failure. The Russian futurist thing was a, was a nice experiment. Uh, but it, you can't go on with it. It can be an individual spark of genius or something. You know, she said, believe this Kevin that was a weird poet, you know, like my teacher thought. And I didn't think of it. <laughs> But, you know, going back to Russian cultural history, it was actually that you know, the Russians who applied for the first time statistics to... Of course, Marvin Chan. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to go to statistics. statistical method yeah. was invented by Russian mathematicians and yeah. literary To prove that Pushkin was actually a better genius than we thought he was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he's, he's, all, he's better than random. Like it's, like, it's like he's as random as you can. In terms of the way the rhyme schemes work, that's yeah. staggeringly fascinating that a human being doesn't isn't predictable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, th that was also the point, right? So in other words, there's there's a way to use statistics, and I'm not sure if you ever thought of using that argument against the Shakespearean, or the <laughs> Shakespearean side, But there is a way to to do statistics, all in order to emphasize precisely a particular agent's identity. And this is the Russian tradition. You know, Mikhail Gasparov is another person who's has come up precisely in, in, in this regard. Yeah, you can zero in on the individuality. You know, I compared, for instance, Shakespeare with Francis Bacon. You know, I took both to show that they're different. Well, it had to do with sound and meaning, so it was just neat, you know, uh, 
But if, if you were going to use statistics to establish individuality, I mean, uh, uh, you have to take into account the uh, enormous spurt in the growth of the database. I mean, what can constitute uh, 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 an irregularity is becoming more difficult the larger the, the database becomes. So that in uh, an era when uh, you know Google is 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 NSA NSA it becomes much more you, you, you cannot just compare you know Pushkin to other Russian poets. I mean you 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 have to start comparing to all the poets who ever wrote, I mean, on under, uh, 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 if you're going to be credible. Luckily, Russian, Russian language doesn't have much of a literature. I know, right? Um, this, this is actually just an anecdote, but I think it's one that's relevant to this question of, of sample size. I was talking to a social scientist friend of mine who, whose faith in statistics and their power is implicit and total. He's a, a quantitative political scientist whose job is to predict events. So whenever he needs a little cash, he hires himself out to the CIA. And um, I was talking to him a couple of years ago about the underground man and about the underground man's attempt just to basically undermine everything that my friend Alistair does, and two plus two is five. And my friend was completely unconcerned. He said, well, we'll just take a bigger sample size and he'll be just an yeah. statistical yeah. outlier. You know, like say it if you want, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have such a huge database that it won't matter. This is why uh, Leibniz, the most unlikely person for whom you could have affection, is somebody I love. I, 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 because that, that reminder to do it is one that could still be made. I mean, to your friend. I mean, yeah. No matter how big the buddy base gets, I mean, it's still uh, predication. And insofar as that's the case, uh, the, the, the possibility of, of chance is always mm -hmm. there. The, the reality of chance. This is the problem that both of you classify as a database. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, in the just, moment you say, right. you know, I will be always voice, how do you find it? You know, you support it. You see, you know, so don't you think that's is a misunderstanding of those people who are not involved in literary analysis. I'm not interested in what some five-year-old child um, who is capable of writing a fable does. I'm interested in what Krylov did, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis Dmitry in the history of Russian uh, fable writing. Why is Krylov, even by Pushkin, considered a great poet, greater than La Fontaine and, you know, on the same level as Eason. Pushkin is not a statistician. Now, I, what, I'm interested in statistical analysis in first, so I apply statistical analysis to uh, Krilov and Dmitriev, and I showed exactly why Pushkin said that Dmitriev is a throwaway compared to Krilov. Now, you'll be signing on this side. Yeah, because that's the literary <laughs> point of view is we want to take examples of literary achievement and to be able to say something which is defensible, not just a matter of our impression, you know, to overcome impressionism. Um, so I, I don't see, or maybe other people see a problem with the business of a database. How much data do you take into account? Um, a cellist who's, who's learning the instrument is of no interest to me compared to, let's say, Pizzigorsky and uh, Who's a good cellist now? Uh, my father's a cellist. Uh, uh, Alicia Wiles, I don't know. But then the question is how much your statistical analysis of Mitri was yeah. the results of that analysis were already predetermined by the task uh, with which you set down to do the analysis. Uh, oh, and I have to say why Pushkin thought that because if we have particular goals that we put in front of us before we do any research, any mathematical research, uh, because we can't claim that any research would be absolute in its purity. So it's inevitably tainted by the objective that we set forth. 
Why? Why would it be taken? Because it probably would be impossible to calculate all the possible permutations and internal relations. So anything as small as one sign. Well, you can narrow it. For instance, in my case, I published a paper on the equivalent, which took only two aspects, meter and discourse. So discourse meaning when there's a dialogue in a table compared to where there is no word, no dialogue. And then what meters are used metrically? What kind of periods do you have? You know, the absence of beats where they're supposed to be equivalent. And there is a pattern. But the, by that token, Rusev would be the best poet that ever lived. <laughs> because well, his, his the variations of his meter and the complexity yeah. of his verse is astounding. Yeah. And much of the verse is worthless. Well, again, that would be one, one value that you would have to range against other things. And then you, but I don't see any, if anybody uh, has done this kind of work with literary text here in this room, applying statistical analysis. It doesn't, um, it doesn't limit you. It's all suggested. You do it enough with different genres and different exponents of genres, you get a picture which you can then use to say, uh, for instance, the idea of genius or greatness. You know, that's what I was interested in. Not, not just because Pushkin said it, it's fine, I, I worship Pushkin, but uh, uh, if, I, if I find that I'm in agreement with some, uh, some opinion, you know, that's what we're always accused of. It's just your opinion. Whereas the scientists say, well, I've got hard proof. Uh, the definition of mathematics that I'm familiar with is the one that Benjamin Kurtz, the great, greatest mathematician, American mathematician in the late 19th century, was the father of the greatest philosopher, Charles Kurtz, who uh, I worship also. And he said, uh, mathematics is the science of making necessary conclusions. We cannot, of drawing, sorry, necessary conclusion. As literary types, we cannot subscribe to that, even if we wanted to, because we will, what you said, what's necessary for you may not be necessary for me. So, uh, where do we, we can't go anywhere with that. Well, I mean, so, this, it doesn't always come down to what, do we, what does it mean to say something that's good. I mean, that's, and that changes, and it depends on who you're asking. Right. And yeah, for me, that's the most interesting question in all literature. Yeah, but that's what we're trying. I think what Michael is uh, would agree is that the temper of the times now is to get away from that because the application of statistics should give us assurance that whatever we statistically analyze is the truth and not not subject to the vagaries of you know you and me. Right? I think this way, I think Beethoven is great, and I don't know, you know, Mozart and Salieri. What? Statistics is applied to mathematics. Yeah. It's not mathematics. Okay. Yes, but but mathematics is kind of a vacant part of mathematics. I think that's the statistical application. Which yeah. has to be compared yeah. to other kinds of statistics. Can I just say sure. Yeah, I just yeah. want to go back to a point about individuality that was made earlier, and also yeah. made it, and, and, and also to, yeah. to Michael Gordon's point about uh, resources. One of the interesting things that occurred to me is that when you think of individuality, the statistics and probability of the applied mathematics, however you want to think of it, of the 17th and 18th century was applied to the ideal man, the ideal rational man. So it didn't matter if there was anyone yeah. that that applied to at all. And by the 19th century, it's the average. And in fact, most of the statistics of the late 19th and early 20th mm -hmm. century are to deal with small sample sizes, not large sample yeah. sizes. So all the t-tests are developed precisely because they don't have large sample sizes. And so they're not concerned with getting enough data. And then in the mid-20th century, you have this concern with the ability of processing power. So I mean, one of the interesting things is, you know, for historians of science, at least one of the things we always are interested in, are the ways in which the technologies of the science, as they change over time, map onto questions about the individuality of the subject, the ways individuality of the subject maybe maps onto, for Galton, genius, 
which is he's very concerned about defining genius with a sample size of about 20 or 30 families, to now where we're not concerned about defining genius, but rather concerned about some sort of all-knowing. So I, I think one of one of the nice things I liked about Nasser's question of the, say, the example of the admissions was that the, the question of, of the individual here is fundamentally ambiguous, and it's not resolvable mathematically, but it's also not resolvably contextually just by by, by pointing to, say, the, the current techniques that are used. And I just wanted to kind of bring, bring back to that historical development. Yeah, that, that was a, a, a very elegant uh, way of uh, turning the history of statistics that Michael was talking about in, 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 into a pattern. Uh, thank you. But I, and I agree. I, I mean, that's sort of his finger on very but I wish they had But I, do, how are we doing after? I, I, I would like to hear. Well, yeah. we, 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 we turn to the literary questions. So I guess maybe I can throw that side in. And, uh, and I, guess, I guess I was also partly interested in thinking about the history, the prehistory of quantitative methods in, uh, in literary study. Um, in, in the sort of more general terms that, that your paper inspired me to think in, uh, in terms of the kind of pattern and then uh, the generality specificity framework or within that framework, um, you know, why work, right? Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, the anime, and so I will, I will follow, I will, I will try to think about that in a limited context of, of, of literary study uh, as such. And I'm glad that there's a voice. I was nervous about being a little bit on the attack, ultimately, and, and that there'd be no voice that would tell me to shut up. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, so I guess um, I will read like a statement, but it will actually be a question. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so that was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, among other reasons that it seems to me helpful to see the current as well as the 19th century situation in these more general terms of pattern and event is that they allow us to avoid, um, at first uh, glance, to uh, overreact in, in either direction. So pattern and event at this level of abstraction are obviously here to stay. The point is not to pick one or the other, but to try to calibrate their many configurations. Michael, you allude to those Slavists, some of whom we know uh, personally, right, who would read 19th century Russian texts precisely with a view to condemning old pattern as proto-totalitarian and celebrating good liberal contingency and freedom without noticing, it seems, that they have just deprived the very values they exalt of their substantive determinants. There are many kinds of contingency, each related to its own kind of counterpart necessity. And there are as many freedoms as there are ways of being determined, the point made minimally by, by, by one of the forefathers of the liberals, by Benjamin Constant, who took modern and, and ancient liberty and put the two together. There's no, there's no one word for that thing. For it, and, and each is related to particular social configurations, right? Particular patterns of determination. determination. So, uh, similarly, in the world of literary study, there is danger in sentimentally clinging on the other side, right? To some sort of uh, unique status of a great text. We talked about this, right? Without recognizing its deep seated participation in the patterns, crystallizing around it, in fact, in patterns that it is. So it's into itself, genres, conventions, school, modes of literary everydayness, all the way down to what in the late 1920s the formalists hesitatingly referred to as the base series, Basel Yap, right, referring to yeah. economic factors. Indeed, as far as literary study is concerned, we all, all I would say, or, or nearly all of its most impressive 20th century achievements to the sort of theory and scholarship that emphasized the pattern side of the dichotomy. So formalism, structuralism, semiotics were all criticized at one time or another for their militant contempt for, for the unique, particular, 
and it seems as a corollary of discontent for their anti humans. So there was, I remember this story about a Soviet Pushkin scholar who, who jumped up after Lotman's very technical uh, presentation on Eugene Onegin and exclaimed, No, so I will do it. But after all, she loves him. <laughs> And incidentally, you know, from that point of view, it's the official Soviet scholarship at the time, the one that was close to the centers, that was the humanist. Yeah. Right? Um, of course, the same, this, the very same, I'm sorry, look, the very same kind of stuff would, would come from the other shore. America says so lots to be confronted by. So further accusations for each of the movements here uh, at issue included inventing very technical languages, jargon, right? Ones that strove for maximal scientific precision in most cases. Mishkovsky here seems to be, in my mind, the only counter example, strove to keep that terminological language as pure as possible with the admixture of, of the sort of thing he was trying to study, that is literary language itself. A very sharp distinction, of course, from criticism. Practical engagement with literature and study of literature as an object. Still more criticism, often Hegelian in inspiration, pointed to the illegitimacy of uncritically rarefying the matter at hand of treating it, whether it is a work, a period, or indeed literariness itself, as something isolated from other domains of life operating according to its own imminent force. And if I may be allowed to, to invoke the voice of Bakhtin, right? His, his cognate uh, critique uh, had everything to do with the assumption of an impartial, stable, third-person perspective, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the sort of object that is more faithfully approached as a thou, right? And at stake here, the thou, the thee, or the, the you, uh, at stake here is not some worshipful or sentimental attitude to the text or the author, but simply an attitude that refuses to hold either the subjective or the objective position of the relationship state, yeah. right, which yeah. is at the center of the epistemic stakes of biology. So once we take a step back and, and, and sort of look at the kind of maybe, maybe extreme uh, remove, uh, what we see is that the contemporary quantitative methods share a number of features with, with its intellectual pairs and are accused of somewhat similar things, right? So they are partial to the pattern, just like we have system, structure, semiotics, or oh, semi-sphere, right? We have, we have pattern here. They construct an independent law governed object as a corollary of an impartial third person subject of the scholar, right? Modeled in some loose ways on the natural sciences. Increasingly less loose, right? Moretti model in uh, soon uh, is, is a kind of shining example. Uh, Linked to this, it seems that there's an emphasis, similar to Shannon's uh, em emphasis on the fact that the question of meaning is irrelevant to the engineering problem, right? there's an emphasis on analysis or explanation as opposed to interpretation. Right? Interpretations will be done away with uh, right? what sort of object I'm constructing or presupposing when we assume that this isn't something for interpretation. They, they, they further, right, they use specialized language, right, luckily this is even easier in a certain sense because they, they don't have to come up with that in the case of oral, in a way, the language of statistics, right, uh, which is deliberately distant from the language that, uh, that, that serves as the object of the study. Finally, they are indeed also anti-humanist and, and, and in, in, in the senses that they're not interested in individual experience of reading or interpretation, and in the sense that the sheer scope of pattern that emerges as a result of their work seems to render individual freedom, whether creative or interpretive, mm -hmm. So the parallels are there, and, and the line of descendants, I think, is clear. In fact, again, they gesture towards that tradition. It's obviously indebted to the form. Um, but I want to echo Michael's uh, moment in, in Michael's paper, which says, and yet, and yet. So, and yet, uh, while there is indeed this continuity between quantitative methods and its predecessor paradigms, I'm reminded of Lermontov's Da, Vuyelush, Lutinat, Nasho, So there's a sense in which 
when you look back to those generations, you want a sense of, like, oh, sorry, this is yay. You know, yeah. uh, there, there were men when, when, when I was young, right? So there, there, there are these, these. They were real, right? They were heroes. And we're, we have really become. They could be stones ten times heavier than we can raise. Right. Exactly. So when you again, uh, you know, maybe this is this is this is prejudice, but I would like to to elaborate on that on that prejudice. So in conclusion, and then I'd like to mention a few differences and ask between these three idealized predecessors and and the, the, the new phenomenon as it appears to me and ask whether they, or some of them, or some combination of them, might not come with the discomfort that some of us feel when confronted with at least some of the major examples of the quantitative method. Um, even though those same some of us are very sympathetic to the, the earlier versions of not unqualified, at least the reason. Um, so first of all, all the predecessors schools and here I've become I've become very uh, shy because we have somebody who's who's written the book on, on Russian formalism and, and and so please again uh uh a question. I mean you, you talked about the three uh, previous periods or, or, or are you talking about the formulas, structures, and the semi Okay, okay. Right, so the things that stand out outside of this somewhat is the kind of phenological hermeneutic tradition to some extent, which we could conceive patterns somewhat differently, and in the other individual with some of the it's obviously obsessive patterns as well. Uh, and, 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 and the, and the you know, say, deconstruction, which is important in, in, in the states, obviously, which is heavily in the structures, parasitic constructions in lots of different ways. Uh, uh, though, again, trying to kind of mitigate it with uh, the more phenomenological currents. Uh, um, someone who I admire again, uh, Yao's reception theory stuff is, is, is also a thing to say. But again, you know, they, 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 the, 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 the people who who, who write uh, uh, write books like uh, Reading by the Number, right? <laughs> There's a very recent book that was just that just came out in 2012, right? Reading by the Numbers, which reminded me of this um, of this event. Pakishki, right? Pakishki. We use both. So 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 all the predecessor schools arose within particularly dynamic revolutionary really, historical moments uh, in close connection with various aspects of, of those historical moments, right? So, so a kind of engagement, a sense of engagement, uh, obviously, in the second and third decades of the 20th century in Russia, the late 60s, uh, mid to late 60s in France, and the thaw in Russia again. Culturally rooted, especially the first two, in the case of formalism and French structuralism, there's a very strong link to the cultural avant-garde and the experiment and experimental literature in particular, as, very, as well as a very high, though probably inflated, unfortunately, conception of the universal historical significance of the study of literature. No, I'm sorry about that. I'm afraid of this. I mean, but but the fact that I think that it is right is a, is a, is a signal. <laughs> How far they fall. Um, connected to this was a very was I think an intensely interdisciplinary environment in which they worked, uh, which came into interesting tension with the claims for autonomy for the object of their study of the scientific method. So, and in particular here, I want to emphasize the the, the extreme importance for all of them in the study of them, the, the sense that. Without linguistics, without an understanding of what language works, whether it's linguistics or philosophy of language, both, right, they did not know what they were doing. They could not imagine what they were doing with these things that were actually linguistic objects or, or, or objects made of, made of language in very particular ways, right? So that's an, an, another another kind of important, uh, another important uh, factor 
but I grew a bit too moment. Finally, uh, all of these factors, I think, uh, the sense of both historical urgency, interdisciplinarity, links to the avant-garde, seem to contribute to an intensely, and this maybe is the, the main really point that I'm trying to make, to a kind of intensely vigilantly reflexive stance in their work. Right? So this reflection proceeded in a number of directions. What, what, in other words, the urgency of asking what it is that I'm doing exactly. Which is related, I think, to the, to the, to this, to the sense that uh, what I'm doing is changing the world. Uh, I think those two come together, go together, and, uh, and, and, and sort of um, uh, the reflection again proceeds in, 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 in a number of directions. It seems to me very strongly political, ideological, right? So all of this stuff about anti-humanism was not about the objectivity of the object. But it was about the critique of the centered subject, right? The sense that we, or ideology critique, right? Essentially, and, and the, the emphasis also in some of these cases is on the emancipation of the material the human from the emptiness and contemplative passivity of the transcendental, right? So the anti-humanism is actually a kind of a kind of humanism. Epistemological uh, reflection, right? What sort of object uh, are we dealing with at all? Uh, with, after all, how all, um, how is it different from other objects in the world? How are they related to other objects? And the disciplinary concern, namely, how does it fit? Where does it fit in in the world, both in the world of other fields of study, neighboring fields of study, but also in the world of in the domain of human activity, right? Very interesting uh, later formalist uh, stuff on on, uh, on literary everydayness, uh, in Brown and Salon, and the Salons in uh, Oh, and so on. It seems to me that none of this is true, and here's the, the conclusion of the quantitative methods of literary study today. I think it's important that rather than originating in the midst of this kind of historical and cultural upheaval, it begins as a branch, begins sort of takes off once again as a branch of a marginalized field of study that is basically in a dead end when it comes to strong theoretical paradigms. Their question is not how am I changing the world, but rather something like this. The world has changed, humanities are in decline, new, de new technologies are developing, how do I successfully adapt? <laughs> For this attitude, no reflexivity is essentially needed. There can, of course, be no talk of a rootedness in aesthetic avant-garde today, right, among this, this kind of, as far as, again, as far as I know, meaning uh, in the sort of cultural activity that feels itself to be at the cutting edge of human experience. And finally, sorry, well, next, uh, its vision of dis interdisciplinarity is highly one-sided, right, seemingly incapable of producing two-way cross-fertilization, cross-fertilizing collaborations like that of, say, Jakobsen and David Strauss, uh, right, uh, though that is a scandal, <laughs> produces a scandalous thing, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing that, that, is, that is thoroughly fascinating, uh, or both of these, both of these really Let's say some more. Is there any is there anything literature can teach statistics? And I, I think it's, the question is not entirely even rhetorical. I, I, I wonder. As for vigilant reflexivity, its absence seems to become most obvious when the questions of language or meaning are concerned. Once again, returning. One of the central, perhaps paradigmatic procedures in this method is counting words. Counting, for example, the number of times a particular character is mentioned in order to determine his or her prominence in the narrative. Right. So this just came out three or four days ago. I received it three or four days ago, and here we have uh, an article by the, the towering figure in the field of quantitative um, literary study, Franco Moretti, who presides over vast, massive lab right at Stanford. Um, and, and, and the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. I mean, the money is literally for us on present. I just want to quote it. Um, so, so there are some, I just wanted to show, I didn't want to uh, introduce the reading. I want to show <laughs> the, the, the kind of curious result. But but really, I wanted to, Moretti is, 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 is probably among the most, um, the most um, reflexive, actually, of the most educated. Best educated. Because he didn't start out as he started out as yeah. Right. And so and so he every time he writes something, he revises. Right? And he says, Well maybe that wasn't quite right. Maybe, right? 
can be built on. There's a kind of ease about taking back what he's done in the past of operator that's both charming and, and alarming. <laughs> uh, it's charming because truly, right, he believes in the scientific method. And so this is what went from underground us all the time. He says something. <laughs> <like that. laughs> right. But Moretti does it in the spirit of enlightenment. Right. Yeah. In other words, somebody makes a good argument, I'll accept it. Mm -hmm. but, but here's one thing that really struck me about counting, counting words, and there's a moment in which he, he gives an example of how it doesn't quite work uh, sometimes. So the following sentence, Mr. Bennett was so odd a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humor, reserve, and caprice, that the experience of, of three and 20 years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his character. Right. So you can't, so the question of how many, how many times the name of the character appears um, uh, uh, in order to determine the centrality of a particular character but it becomes tricky because Mr. Bennett in this account gets one and Mrs. Bennett gets zero. While we know that right, it is Mrs. Bennett who is in fact receiving, right? So this is Jane Austen. And uh, if this were right, if this were for bear, we would know that in fact Mrs. Bennett is at least as present, right? And if this is Henry James, then forget about Mr. Bennett altogether, right? Then yeah, the main yeah, thing yeah. Is, is, is is Mrs. Bennett. So, so the, so the question then becomes, right, uh, Moretti says, Moretti says, okay, sorry, uh, this didn't work, uh, this is why you should forget, the, this, this method doesn't work with novels, right, let's, let's, let's go to plays. Right? So what team size are, size with relief at this moment, right, uh, right, but, 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 uh, but, but nevertheless we have this, again, this sense that, um, the new left of you, right? The, the, the most recent. Okay. So, uh, so, so, uh, just to conclude, right? So, um, again, this is spoken of as is a kind of minor, minor thing. There's more sophisticated stuff going on here, of course, right? And, 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 and right. But, but the fact that in, in, in 2014, after however many decades of this stuff going on, right, there's still this conversation about it prominence of characters in, in terms of the appearance of their names, and that that still needs to be rejected, strikes um, strikes one as, as incredibly naive. Um, and, 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 uh, and again, one of the, I guess one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that we read, uh, the, the title of this is fantastic, especially given the code right, issues. Uh, it says, title, Antigone Decode, right? Uh, right, so not reinterpreted, not right, decoded, and, uh, and and I think I'm, I'm happy. I would be happy to, to talk about how that decoding takes place. It's actually quite curious, but I won't continue. So, uh, so just another very very quick classical consideration about language, right? And, and what, what what that what that does, right? Meaning um, is all about absence, right? Uh, so, so Seurer's famous proclamation of language and language are only differences, right? So sounds mean by not being other sounds, words through a kind of determinate negation depend on for their meanings on the words they exclude, right? And so this, this notion of presence or absence seems to be seems to be very tricky, obviously, in language, and it, it seems to not quite be, as far as I know. Um, Captured, but but really, but really more, more at, at, at stake. I think even addressed right, in, in any kind of uh, thorough, thorough way. So, you know, not to say that these are not smart and, and, and well-meaning and thoughtful people that do this, and they do reflect on their relationship sometimes with math and language. But the reflection tends to function as, as what formalists would call the motivation for the device. Right. In other words, the device is what matters, and literally in this case, right. It's the important thing, a new tool that can be applied to the object, which is not being reconceived fast enough with the application of the tool. And so the occasional shock or the sense of tremendous naivete of these endeavors may result precisely from this, that the tools of the application come before reflection, right? not live as, as in so many other cases. And if there is reflection, it is a kind of afterthought to justify what is just happening to apply. And at the same time, the last point that one that you made was there's a huge amount of money. <laughs> and, 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 and as far as jobs are concerned, right, 
it feels increasingly like a zero sum <laughs> right, in which we are we are losing. <laughs> I mean, we. Uh, the MLA is uh, a lot. I, I mean, the, the people who do digital humanities uh, are absolutely uh, driving the bus now. I, I, I mean, it is a, a very disturbing profession. And Stanford is kind of the perfect place for this to happen, this question of, of adaptation, like how will we adapt to this new world, because Stanford is that new world. I mean, it's never actually been particularly strong in humanities, social science and science institution in many ways. And it, it makes sense that if you're there, you wouldn't get on that bus. Silicon Valley. Yeah. Silicon Valley. And Cambridge is not innocent. No, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would like to uh, kind of uh, relativize it historically. I, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 60s. And you know, in the 60s, we did. You know, theory from, of information was the hottest name in the world. I mean, you know, who remembers Max Benz, uh, Abraham Moore, all these gi giants of, of yeah, if there's a lot. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, we were counting here the third degree of freedom and the fifth and third degree of freedom. I don't remember what we did, but... So, so part of the question is, is there something, I mean, I feel like, what are we, what are we worrying about? I mean, it seems... So, so one, I think, I, I, I feel synthetic sometimes. I feel like, oh, this new toy. Right? They got this new toy, they'll play around with it and it'll go away, but it doesn't work that way. I don't know what it does. And, this, no, I, I, this is why I would insist on, on uh, education. I, 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 uh, it, it's particularly appalling. I mean, that that uh, practical learning is, is, is doing this. I, I, the, uh, but you know, he, he's, he's quite different from most of the people who do digital humanities. I mean, who are uh, who don't know. Statistics, uh, and they, they really don't know much about uh, uh, the history of literature either. I mean, how, how do you read? It, it, it's sort of so. So what? Uh, I, I just want to. This is, I, I, I think, to to say, don't worry. It's not to recognize the real difference, which you, you were pointing to. I, think, I mean, between what is happening in distant reading and the new technologies on which it draws, as opposed to the kind of cultural base that formalism had, or, or, or structuralism, as far as that goes, which is philosophically true. I mean, in many ways. Uh, and, and, and certainly linguistically, as you pointed out. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, the only theory of language that I can see uh, present in most of what's called digital humanities, is is uh, a computational linguistics. It doesn't go beyond that. But that's where a lot of the work. I mean, at Harvard, they have this this huge. I mean, you can, but any is is open to any. The culture of Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I think which is is it, where where by the way, Franco gets a lot of respect. So I, I I think there is to, it, it is to worry. I mean, this this is a different. Uh, kind of it, 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 is, it gives a new meaning to the anti-humanism of systematism. I'm also wondering if it is turning the humanities into a social science, um, because now you have teams of scholars, and just as in hard science and social sciences, you have multiple authors, you, you have the same thing, and that's where the money is in the social sciences and hard sciences. The, the source of Lingua Latina is a group of yeah. people working together, collaborating, and like that. That's been that's that, that centuries old. So yeah. Yeah, the collaboration alone is not the problem. Right. Let me get away from the worries. I mean, uh, you know what? What was interesting about I I found I like them. You know, our Arabic uh, one. I was the Arabic at least partially conceived of this difference between you know the, the issue of metallic. Yeah. 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 Because you know you get this Freudian paradox that you cannot separate meta language from object language. Mm -hmm. And you are caught in the web of you know, differences, different analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have the kind of a more wide and rustic approach that you can separate them. And of course, mathematics is ideal for yeah. it. Is, it is something which is not 
all of the disease amount. The problem, of course, the secondary problem is how then you get this total abstraction to the messy language. How do you think this? You worry about this. So I think that's one way of thinking about it. Could I have a second what, what you said in your reply, but also what Michael said in reply to you about education? That we need to educate, I mean, we, the people on the humanist side, need to educate people who don't come at it from, from our perspective. That the, all of art has uh, a dimension which is lacking from, from science, I mean, the way it's presented to the public. That art um, is supposed to be creative, meaning that you're, supposed, you're not trying to replicate what someone else did. You're trying to do something original. And that originality can only be perceived retrospectively by the community of interpreters. And so the predictability, which was a kind of uh, facet of physics envy, you know, that we all had when we were when we were good scientists, we wanted to do humanities. We want to predictability is the nub of the problem. We cannot predict Shakespeare. We cannot. We can only retrospectively interpret something which already exists and say why is it great? Because that's what interests us. Um, and so that clash between the phys physics, which predicts according to laws, and then art which takes, to the extent that we interpret, we take something from the past and want to come up with uh, a, a theory of the object that we're interpreting, you know, using theory very loosely. Those things are uh, antagonistic to each other. We're not predicting this. We're re retrospectively trying to understand why it's great. Because we're not going to bother with, uh, with things which we don't consider valuable. So. How, how can we reconcile these two things? You cannot reconcile this from a digital perspective because the whole digital revolution has to do with, with being able to write programs. Programs rely on predictability. So, uh, but yeah, the, the, the issue is what you call the value. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, the value. value. If, you, if you, in the moment you are in publishing business, the value is a completely different meaning and you try to predict for this. Well, if you're in America, the only value that counts is money. And this, you know, what's the cash value? Cash value is a phrase. I'm a linguist, so I can tell you that goes back a very long way in the history of American English. Cash, what is the cash value? Have you heard that phrase? Okay, that has a very old history in American English. I mean, we, you know, America's not that old. But what is the value? Okay, cash. How much no, cash is it? It's many values. <laughs> No, but that's the supervening value. That's all that we do. If you look historically at uh, the way America has developed, in America, it's always cash. Yeah, but this is because it's quantified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talk not talking about Bitcoin. I'm not describing some poor guy. Yeah, I think uh, one, one of the more, uh, in addition to characterizing this stuff, the, the, the uh, lab, Moretti's lab, and the way that it's conceived, has been critiqued by people for one kind of curious uh, fact of, of its organization, namely that you know the idea of distant reading, in other words, reading or mastering in some fashion, vast corpuses cor 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 of uh, of, of, of literature, philologists, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, the the um, the, the idea of, of, of achieving this and the idea of doing this cross culture presupposes native informants, right? So there are these native informants who are anonymous, right? Because this Moretti, Moretti appears, right? Who are you know, more or less anonymous, maybe they get a footnote, maybe not, right? Who come to him, right, from all of these third world countries, right? To him who sits at Stanford, right? and they report to him the data or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever they have found. And then he systematizes, right? He's the brain, right? and that, and that, I don't just mean he. I mean, you know, right? So there's a strange kind of, you know, re the critique is right. There's a strange kind of reproduction 
of, the, of other kinds of logics that you might trouble in this collect in this particular organization of collaboration. So in the way, right, the collaboration is not just about the fact that there is one, right, but the fact that it takes a particular shape in this in this context. Now, not, not to say that they weren't hierarchical in the past as well, right, but, but to wonder maybe how how they can be less so. Or just how um, I want to say trustworthy, but not. But I mean, there's an abstraction going on there. How does he know his native informants are giving him the information once? Or I mean, they also are going to get a bigger sample size. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're getting their, their point of view. You know, and he's not querying that. But is there some overlapping that uh, he's looking for in a number of informants? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So Pattern. So that's the, and in some ways, it's an institutionalization of the Kantian approach to art, like he separated the, uh, the census communis within, not, not individually, but within an individual, because we all have the same transcendental conditions of perception. They are more or less the same in all of us. So there's got to be some overlapping in whatever we do subjectively, on which we can build some other consensus externally or internally within us. And in a way, this statistically, from the other end, uh, feeds into the same distinction. But, I mean, but, I, yeah. I mean, I guess the question is, the question would then be what, what, what the categories are, what the relevant categories would be or can be, right? Can, is it, what, does it just have to be, I mean, if, if you just had measure, a number, quantity, right? You, you have a problem with that. Repetition. I mean, as one of them. But I mean, I feel like the I think I feel like Kant would. Yeah, I wonder what, what Kant would say uh, about this, right? I mean, I think I, I agree with you that there is a, there's a continuity. But his uh, I mean, but, his, his but notion that of the possibility to argue about taste comes down to to this similarity that we all have. But is it, but is it the similarity that, that's reducible, or, or is the proper language to speak about that similarity? Absolutely. No, no, this is why we can't, uh, this is why we can't only quarter, but not for you. Uh, uh, one part. would have to add, uh, and I uh, have some unease in, in adding a, in, in, in my voice uh, as a character of a uh, One thing you would have to add would be the historicity of the census community, uh, that uh, when uh, Michael was talking about value in the United States being based in economics, uh, I, I think he was something that is not just uh, a slap in the face of, of the United States, but it, it, it's what it, it refers back to. The, the driving sense of values behind what's changing the, the profession of the teaching of literature. That, that's why I mentioned before the MLA. One of the reasons I think why quantification uh, and distant reading is uh, flourishing right now is because the people who have always suspected there was something un-American about the teaching of literature in American universities <laughs> I, I, I mean, they were right. They were right. And, and, uh, but this sounds American. This sounds American. And uh, not only because it has to do with what we all know we can trust, numbers, it, it, it has to do also with uh, a change in fashion in the academy. You're much more likely to get a job if you do digital humanity and somehow it, it, it insert that into your CV. And if you uh, 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 try to sell yourself as a philologist, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so I, I think that uh, in, in talking, nobody knows what that means. Well, but how is that different from 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 needing to be, you know, a, a scholar of postcolonial theory, say a decade ago, or or needing to be whatever else five years before that? No, no, the difference between, I, I mean, uh, uh, the, the people who were, uh, uh, I will name no names, but I mean, the, the people who were doing colonial theory and, and uh, literary social studies of various kinds, uh, 
uh, were, were perceived as outsiders by the rest of the community. I mean, they, 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 they were not being funded in a way that the Stanford Center for the Study of the Novel was being funded. And uh, uh, who were perceived in the, the heart, as if it is, you were pointing out that, I mean, it, it, it's not by chance that Stanford is uh, uh, where uh, uh, much of the intellectual energy of this is emanating from. The, the, uh, uh, what uh, Franco Moretti is doing is perceived as being very much uh, uh, as, as part of a rejection of the fashion that, that came before. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's one. Fashion to end fashion. The, the fashion, yeah, no, the, as we know, there are no fashions yet. Okay? I, 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 but but it, 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 it appears to be at the moment. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, I, you're recognizing that. I, I mean, the question then becomes, not, not I mean, don't worry, I mean, but, but, but what do we do? Uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm quite. Uh, 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 pragmatically, I mean, what can be done? I have a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, but it's difficult to implement, and that is the uh, the way to convince people that humanities are valuable in the old sense is through mental health. So we must, we have to convince. I, I've thought about this a lot. You have to convince the medical community, especially the ones that are dealing with. You know that 40 or 50 million people take antidepressants in the United States? Mm -hmm. Do I get another? So there are 300 million people. So let's say that that's an underestimate. And there are 70. Well, it takes 150 tablets a day. Okay. So <laughs> mental health over a lifetime, to me, is that's what I would urge. That's the, the wedge. We've got to convince psychiatrists, the whole mental health industry, that, that humanities, you know, whether it's uh, continuing education, I don't know what's the. Uh, I would suggest that an even potentially more effective intervention would be to convince the business schools, and that. But that process has already started. They teach novels as a way of becoming a better reader. Supposedly, they've quantified it that if you read two Jane Austen novels, you're then this much better an analyst of this particular case. Yeah, that's 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 exactly. That's 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 business school. And it has been, I mean, it's been published repeatedly, and they have even more power than doctors. So if you really want an effective <laughs> intervention, I think, you know, that's one way to take it. Um, uh, let me just say, you now you go ahead, and I'll say something else. Go ahead. Uh, uh, going back to this case value and why, you know, it is now taking all the world, the, the usual explanation why the United States case value is the most important one was this is a giving up nation, a bunch, it's what we can all for, uh, share. It's a bunch of strangers, it. and what is the only one, you know, the only value we can create. But now we are experiencing the, the globalization of literary science. So again, this cash value, so to speak, but is very big. Right? Well, but it is the globalization and you know the you know, too many traditions. It's the endless intellectual. Globalization means Americanization of sure, the world. Sure. I, I, I'm yeah, not saying that, but <laughs> I'm just saying that. Well, you and I are both immigrants. I don't know who else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and what were you going to say? Oh no, this is actually. I, I'm sorry, but it's another anecdote, and it's an anecdote that brings together Stanford and Fyodor, actually, who you mentioned, and this is um, a oh, yeah. former student of mine, undergraduate, very, very intelligent student who was uh, Russian and a finance major at Stern, also came to us and did a Russian literature major, and then when he finished his undergraduate, he went and started a company as an entrepreneur, made a lot of money by selling apartments on the internet in a new way to Chinese people. And what did he use that money to do from selling his first company to ensure that his body would be cryogenically frozen? Oh, when he dies, he's in his 20s. And, but that's all said. And he used his money for that. And now he's at Stanford Business School. And you, there's, this, there's this coming together of this like ecstatic belief in the power of technology to change everything. He really doesn't believe we need to die. He really doesn't. And he also believes that how the way that we're not going to die is through some version of Twitter. I mean, some next new technology. So he's at Stanford Business School posting on Facebook about Fyodorov and meeting all these people who are going to 
let us live forever through technology. Really? Yeah. Well, he's your first And it's fascinating because he's and he's not at all embarrassed to say, I don't think I'm going to die. But, but I, you put your finger, I think, on something. The, 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 this turn to quantification is a, 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 a chapter in the history of religion. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the kind of claims that are made for I mean, the, the, this is where I mean, the, 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 the of course, when he's a historian, the, the correspondence between Leibniz and Pascal I, 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 is, is, is really something that everybody who goes to business school should be forced <laughs> to read. I, 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 uh, uh, but the, 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 I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to uh, introduce uh, you know, critical <laughs> thinking uh, 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 and, and, and to, to raise doubts about the possibility of absolute truth being found in numbers is that it has uh, uh, now in things like uh, uh, H plus uh, uh, found a theology, theology, and, and, and the possibility of believing that you you can live forever is just. The, 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 the most, uh, uh, I mean, it's the stupidest way, but it's also the, 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 the most uh, 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 revealing way in, in which uh, the idea of technology as salvation, in, in, in the religious sense of the word, uh, can be seen. So this isn't, I thought of it as something sort of, Russian about him, but it's not. He's not. No, I said. Oh, listen. Oh, sorry. Look for him. Blood transfusion. Yeah. No, no, right. Yeah. 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 And he died. That's not great. It's an urban. Why is he not so much interested in that? I'm not sure. Yeah. He's just being very shy. No, actually, I was just thinking about. about, about I mean, so there's something odd about the production of, for example, the transhumanist work. Or the sort of Mutterberg you know, uh, kind of euphemic yeah. kind of intervention, you know, in that that they don't necessarily. It's as if you have two discourses that that can be flipped on and off, right? So there's a times when we talk about it as the, the sort of threat of computation, and it almost operates in a kind of secular mode when we do so. Right? Yeah. And then, so for example, you know, um, Kurzweil will say that you know, he's produced these scanners that. Effectively allow the blind to see because they can speak the words that the blind can't see, or these music synthesizers that will help people produce music who otherwise would be handicapped in respect to that, and so on. And then, while well, speaking those terms, a lot of that is being generated by computational work, right? And it's a lot of the way in which one could argue some of the things in the digital humanities can't have legitimacy. Yet. You know, there's ultimately a kind of Liberating aspect to you know, opening up the texts, to spreading them, to scanning them, to giving them to as many people as possible, to liberating the archive. That's one mode. But with a with a very quick flip, there's often an indication, exactly as you say, as these you know, practical Christological figures, right? Suddenly we are doing the we are doing the miraculous here, right? We are transcending ourselves. We are not humans. We are transhumans in a very different sense. Here. Then Julian Hopkins, then the earlier one that I talked about this, and that is it, you know, invokes this other notion, notion of, this, of the singularity, right? As the, the absolutely unmeasurable, the uncountable, that which is not commensurable to statistical analysis, that which is something that is an access to. It, you know? So I, I, you know, this kind of the ways in which the one as it were undercuts the other is something that I don't quite understand. Right? There's there's a way in which you know, the, the, the fact that there's an indication of the religious and theological constantly sort of hovering to the side of this age of computation, right, suggests that it knows itself as something other than, you know, simply saying that we capture the human by running a, a, a set of statistical packages. You know? Well, this is where I think the concept of miracle can be introduced into the conversation. That is to say that the thing that, that uh, binds uh, the invention of that, that synthesizer, uh, and which has made Stevie Wonder a spokesman for H plus, 
I mean, with, think of the popular uh, 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 reception of Stevie Wonder. I mean, for I mean, making claims. But who is our Stevie Wonder? <laughs> <laughs> What connects that, uh, that was a really amazing breakthrough. I mean, I, I, I mean Kurzweil is a real inventor. I, I mean, and, and it, 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 it does seem, I, I, that thing that he invented uh, that lets you, you, uh, it's a machine that reads and then speaks. So it, 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 this is why Steve you want to do blind. It, it, it's one, it's, it, 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 the machine looks at the book and then speaks the text. I mean, so you don't have to use uh, Braille. Uh, it, it, is, um, it, it really is. It's a miracle. <laughs> That's the point. I mean, the, uh, the, the, and Curtis Bile, who's very uh, 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 careful about not making theological claims. Nevertheless, does, I mean, in the name of any specific theology, nevertheless, it either replicates the idea of a resurrection using the miraculous power of retroengineering. I mean, there's a sense in which retroengineering, if, if uh, uh, that uh, uh, transhumanism has a theology is rooted in reverse engineering. I mean, that, but what I'm trying to suggest is that, that, that the technology is like a miracle to faith. That, that it, it's what it, 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 it's why they they, they are uh, they have such hope. I, I just want to kind of train what I will be talking about later. Is that miracle is event? This is the yes, yeah, 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 yeah. not expected. Yeah. 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 Are we talking about hubris here? Being God? Hubris? Well, I think. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hubris. It, 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 it's a plus. plus. <laughs> Another H plus, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I, was, I, guess, I guess this is. This is Else. It strikes me as, you know, referring to this particular thing on this invention as a miracle, it strikes me obviously as, as a kind of mystification that is not unlike, you know, some 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 form of right false consciousness or some form of of, of of avoiding talking about concrete, you know, ways in which this is, this stuff is produced. That right, right. In, in other words, avoiding taking responsibility in the full sense of the word about the Whatever social organizations we presuppose, right, in order to produce this, right. So it just sounds like a, a mystifying gesture, not unlike, you know, any any number of gestures. So I guess for one, of the question was in the critique, in the critique, sorry, in the reflection on transhumanism. I imagine there is work being done right now, precisely in order to to debunk this these notions. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, there's, there's a, 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 I mean, by the Templeton Foundation. Yes, at ASU, and in fact, the type is some of this in terms of a, of a kind of theological moment. But it was, it was sort of, it was easier to work in the past, in certain ways, I think, when a lot of this sort of reemerged in, in the 80s. There was a lot of a, of a kind of sort of um, and maybe people here know this can correct this to a certain extent, but there was a lot of a kind of um, libertarian moment. Yeah. Right. So, in fact, the, the, your anecdote is just to the point that this is surviving. It's not about investing, as it were, money in a kind of social heritage or in a kind of. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it is about, yeah, precisely about one's individuality, and there it was very, very rugged. It was, it was set on the basis of often you know, natural selective terms. If you have the money to survive, that's great. Otherwise, you die and you're abolished. Too bad for you, right? But, but more recently, there have been other forms of organization, some of which are are have emerged in, in Europe that say, you know, we have to try to find a way that say basically, yes, actually stepping back, understood against a certain sort of historical framework, we are kind of miracles. But those miracles have to imagine a policy of some kind that 
will somehow watch over itself and make sure that maybe we can all live and maybe not just Kurzweil's father will be resurrected, but all of our fathers in precisely this kind of Which would then be for the Roman, because it's a common test. Well, there, there, yeah. he, uh, but there, there, he, I, I mean, Kurzweil, I, 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 I don't think that's the way here, but, I, 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 but I, I, he is uh, a Democrat as far as bringing back the dead. The, 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 it is a common task, and he, he and he's made a business out of it. I mean, he has, a, a, you know, seriously. I mean, he sells pills that will help you live forever, uh, uh, which is one of the reasons why he takes so many pills. Uh, uh, and, and and so, the, and, and you don't have to pay the money the cryogenics requires. I mean, for, for the, it's it's a cheaper technology. So he's trying to expand. The, the, there are these. These evil Democrats. I think he's, uh, 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 the other is the man who runs the SAT. I mean, who wants to extend? The, I mean, the, 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 the idea of extending the privilege of uh, living forever or, or everybody doing better in, in, in school is, is uh, still based in statistics. I mean, it's still. But why to preserve for all life? Because it is unique and unrepeatable. Anyway, it's not statistics. Well, exactly. <laughs> and that, that, that was a question. I, 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 there's a wonderful interview with Chris Watt in, in uh, Rolling Stone that ends with the, the reporter asking him, well, if you brought your father back, what would you say to him? And I, I, I think that, that, that it gets to the business of, of the specificity of, of, of the person. I mean, what, what, what would... What would you say to your resurrected father? Um, I think that maybe I'll stop us on that note because it's, it's time to take a break and we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock. But thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, Diana, sir, and everybody else. This was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.